PRM. So it's a great pleasure to have you here, William, and uh, the stage is all yours. Okay, good. Um, well, thank you for the introduction. So uh, what is this talk going to be about? Uh, so a common intuition uh, is that if you have some computational task, uh, say you want to map an input x to some output y, uh, and imagine you want to repeat this task many times. So you have r inputs x1 through xr, uh, and you want to map them to outputs y1 through yr, uh, then a common intuition is that the, the cost of repeating that task many times should basically scale as uh, the number of repetitions times the cost of just performing that task once. Uh, because, I mean, just like obviously this should be true. Um, is there any way to hide this, by the way? Uh, which one? Okay. Is that better? Okay. Um, good. So yeah, the common intuition is that the cost should scale basically as you know r times the cost of the task. Uh, and indeed, there are many computational settings in which you can actually rigorously prove that something like this holds. Uh, these are usually known as direct sum theorems. And some examples of computational settings that admit direct sum theorems include most variants of communication complexity and query complexity and also some things like monotone circuit size and formula size. Um, but nevertheless, direct sum theorems are actually not universal. Uh, in fact, there are some computational settings that admit what I like to call a mass production phenomenon, where uh, the cost of repeating the task many times actually does not scale linearly. Uh, it actually becomes cheaper on a per unit basis as you increase the number of repetitions. Uh, and to give you kind of a, a canonical example of this, uh, it comes from uh, matrix multiplication. And uh, let's say you fix some n by n matrix M over, say, the field with two elements. And you consider an input x, which you interpret as a uh, n by 1 column vector. And your goal is just to perform the matrix vector multiplication to multiply x by this fixed matrix M to get an output y. Then uh, if you look at, say, uh, Boolean circuit complexity, so you measure the, the cost of computing something by the number of and, or, and not gates that you need to build a circuit that evaluates the function, then it's not hard to show by a simple counting argument that you need uh, basically n squared many gates uh, to compute something like this. In fact, you get a bound that's like n squared over log n. Um, and uh, nevertheless, it's also not too hard to show that uh, if you repeat the same function many times, so now uh, we don't have just one vector, we have n different vectors, then now this iterated matrix vector multiplication is essentially just a matrix matrix multiplication. So we can use fast matrix multiplication algorithms to uh, compute this in better than brute force time. So naively, you would need time that scales as like, say, n cubed or something. But uh, if you use an algorithm for multiplying two n by n matrices that runs in time uh, n to the omega, where you know, currently the best bound on the, the matrix multiplication exponent is like omega is at most 2.38 or so, then you get a bound on the computational complexity that is substantially less than the naive bound of, of just repeating you know, the same algorithm n times. So this is a really nice example. Uh, but nevertheless, you might be left with the impression that these sorts of mass production phenomena can only occur for these really special functions like matrix multiplication that have a certain algebraic or combinatorial structure. You know, surely uh, you, know, you need some sort of structure to get something like this. Uh, and what's really remarkable and not very well known is that that actually kind of turns out to be false. Uh, so in particular, sticking with uh, th this example of looking at Boolean circuit complexity, so and or not gates, um, let's look at a uniformly random Boolean function. So like, you know, surely you would think a random function is as unstructured as possible. How could you possibly mass produce something like that? Well, it's well known that if you have a, a uniformly random n bit function, then for, for almost all n-bit functions, uh, the cost of computing that as measured by the number of gates is exponential in n. In particular, it's something like 2 to the n divided by n. Um, and what's quite remarkable is this little-known theorem due to Ulig that was proved uh, actually almost 50 years ago, which shows that uh, for any Boolean function f on n-bits, 
And any number of repetitions, which is sub-exponential, in particular like two to the little o of n over log n, um, you can actually compute r copies of a worst case function f for essentially the same cost it takes to just compute a single copy of a worst case function f. Um, you know, the, the same bound of roughly two to the n over n. Uh, and in fact, I don't show it here, but actually the constant in this theorem uh, is actually tight. So, so that the leading order constant actually matches the lower bound. And so this is saying you can basically mass produce a random Boolean function with essentially no overhead, which I think is really quite interesting and surprising. Um, and you know, as you might guess, kind of the, the main question we explore in this talk is does something similar happen in the quantum setting? So say instead of computing a Boolean function, you want to you know, evaluate unitary transformation or prepare many copies of some quantum state. Are there any cases in which you can you know, do something similar and get some sort of mass production speed up? Or is there some barrier in the quantum setting that uh, you know, maybe like the no cloning theorem or something that makes something like this difficult? Um, well, as you might be able to infer from the title of this talk, uh, our main results show that, in fact, you can generalize Ulrich's theorem to the quantum setting uh, in two different ways. Uh, the first is a mass production theorem for states. So it shows that for any n qubit state uh, psi, and again, for any number of repetitions, that's uh, sub-exponential. The quantum circuit complexity of preparing r copies of psi scales as roughly uh, 2 to the n, which is exactly the same uh, as the complexity of just preparing a single copy of a Haar random state. Um, here I'm measuring circuit complexity in the quantum setting by just assuming without loss of generality that our gate set uh, consists of arbitrary single qubit gates and C-naught gates, and then I'm just counting the number of C-naught gates. Um, this only changes things by most a constant factor if you want to work with other gate sets. Uh, and then similarly, there's, uh, we also have a mass production theorem in the unitary setting. So for any n qubit unitary transformation, and again for any number of repetitions that is sub-exponential, you can implement r copies of a unitary for basically the same cost. You know, it, you know, by counting argument, you can show there's like a lower bound of 4 to the n to compute uh, a Haar random unitary, and you can actually match that in the mass, mass production setting, uh, at least up to constants. So uh, these are the main results I'm going to be talking about. Uh, in my remaining time, I'm going to try to give you a brief overview uh, of the main ideas that go into this proof. Um, as you might be able to guess, uh, the proof builds heavily uh, on the proof of Ulig's theorem for Boolean functions. So actually, most of what I'm going to do is tell you, you know, a, a very quick summary of how Ulig's theorem works. And then I'll just kind of briefly explain uh, what are the key differences to extend it to the quantum setting. So, um, so how does Ulig's theorem work? So uh, again, we have some n-bit Boolean function f that we're trying to mass produce that we fix in advance. Uh, and actually, the way the theorem is structured, uh, it really suffices just to show how to compute two copies of a Boolean function for basically the same cost as one. And then once you've done that, there's sort of a recursive argument, a natural recursive argument that you can apply to go from two copies to multiple copies. So we're just going to focus on, you know, given a function f, and an input x and y, how do you compute f of x and f of y simultaneously uh, using fewer resources than you might naively expect? And um, the first few steps of the proof look kind of like magic, and I'm just going to blitz through them a little bit. But uh, at the end, I'll kind of give you a sort, sort of more intuitive explanation for what's going on. So uh, we start by defining these functions f sub i, uh, where we fix some parameter k in advance. And these functions f sub i are just defined by uh, restricting the last k bits of f to be the binary representation of i. So these are functions on n minus k bits instead of n bits. And uh, then we define these functions g sub l uh, for l between 0 and 2 to the k minus 1 that we get by uh, XORing together uh, basically f sub l minus 1 and f sub l. Uh, except for these two edge cases, so for 0 and 2 to the k minus 1, you don't XOR with anything. So, okay, uh, what does this do? Like, why would we even consider doing this? Uh, well, the thing that Ulig observes is that um, any of these functions f sub i can be decomposed in two different ways as a sort of telescoping sum, a, a telescoping XOR sum of these GIs. Uh, in particular, because if you XOR something with itself, you just get 0. Um, you can write fi as the XOR of all functions between g0 and gi uh, 
uh, or equivalently as the XOR of all functions between g i plus one and g sub two to the k. Um, okay, so why does that why does that do anything? Um, kind of the key idea in Ulig's proof is we will use one of these decompositions to compute f of x and the other decomposition to compute f of y. So in particular, if we say that i and j are the, the binary representations of the last k bits of x and y, then you, know, you can write f of x and f of y as f sub i of you know, x1 through xn minus k and f sub j of y1 through yn minus k. And what we're going to do is, you know, supposing without loss of generality that i is less than or equal to j, we will compute f of x using this first decomposition and f of y using this second decomposition. And you know, why this works? Well, okay, I'm not gonna go through the details, but you, you, know, you work out the math. Uh, you, you see that the cost of computing f on two inputs this way is dominated by the cost of computing all of these sub-functions g. And kind of the key point is that by breaking it up into these two cases, you only ever have to compute each function g at most once. And when you do the math, uh, what you find is that the circuit complexity uh, of computing f on two inputs basically matches the circuit complexity of computing a worst case f on just a single input. Um, so you know, this proof, to me, at first, really looked quite mysterious and magical. So if you're confused, I do not blame you at all. What I'm going to try to do is give you like, a very high level intuitive explanation for what's going on. Uh, and I think the way I interpret it is as follows. So imagine you have like an if-then-else statement in your favorite programming language, um, you know, like Python or C or whatever, then you know, the way we, th that a, a program evaluates something like this is you, you, you first test the predicate, and then depending on that predicate, you either evaluate the first half or the second half. And the point is that you, know, you only have to uh, ever pay for one uh, of the two conditional clauses, right? Uh, you don't have to pay for both. But uh, whereas that works in, in, in like the Turing machine setting for a program, unfortunately that doesn't work for circuit complexity because in circuit complexity, you kind of need to have a circuit lying around to compute the first half and a different circuit lying around to compute the second half. And there's no way that sort of using this sort of branching actually gives you any savings, um, at least not naively. But kind of Ulig's idea uh, at a high level is to structure your if clause in some way that both branches of the if clause compute something useful. So in particular, kind of like you know, the, the yes case will compute f of x and the no case will compute f of y. And somehow you can do this you know, for any, any n bit Boolean function. Uh, and, and I think that's really where the cleverness lies. Um, so that's pretty much everything I wanted to say about Ulig's theorem. Um, so how do we generalize this to the quantum setting? Um, so kind of the key idea is, you know, again, we define this uh, for this function f, all these sub-functions f sub i and these functions g. And the key observation in this paper is that all of these steps still go through uh, if you make just one change, which is that rather than considering functions from n bit to one bit, uh, you consider functions that output, uh, that go from n bits to an arbitrary complex phase. So, you know, in instead of a zero or one, it's just some uh, complex number of the form e to the i theta for arbitrary theta. And um, basically by replacing the group zero or one under the, the XOR function with the group of complex units under multiplication, you can define uh, completely analogously these functions g sub i, where again you get some sort of telescoping property that uh, you can express these functions f sub i as products in two different ways uh, of these g sub l's. And the key thing to note is that uh, if you have a function that is mapping n bits to some complex unit, that is basically just a diagonal unitary transformation because you know, that just tells you, you know, what, what is the entry of, of the diagonal co corresponding to that n bit string. And so if you work through the details, what you get is that Ulick's proof generalizes pretty straightforwardly uh, with you know, a couple of caveats to mass producing not just Boolean functions, but basically arbitrary diagonal unitary matrices. Um, and the circuit that does this is depicted here. Uh, I'm not really gonna explain how it works, but like, if you squint hard enough, there's like some classical computations going on. And at the end of the day, it, it basically computes something very similar to how Ulick's proof works, uh, just working with complex phases uh, instead of bits. 
So that's how you mass produce diagonal unitaries. But I promised you at the start that we were not going to mass produce just diagonal unitaries. We were going to mass produce arbitrary unitaries or uh, mass produce quantum states. So how, the way we do that um, is by using uh, actually pretty well-known decompositions uh, of quantum states and unitary transformations into diagonal gates. Um, so I won't fully explain what these mean, but sort of intuitively uh, what they say is that if you have some n qubit state psi, you can always express it as you know, a couple of diagonal gates, some single qubit gates uh, applied to just some n minus 1 qubit state phi. And if you apply this decomposition recursively, you get sort of uh, a, a circuit to compute psi whose cost is dominated by computing diagonal unitaries. And then by mass producing those diagonal unitaries, you can get a circuit that mass produces psi. Uh, and then similarly in the unitary case, there's you know, an analogous statement that if you have some n qubit unitary transformation, there's a way you can recursively decompose it into diagonal gates and single qubit gates in such a way that the cost is dominated by the diagonal gates. You mass produce the diagonal gates, and in doing so, you, you mass produce the n qubit unitary. So that's kind of all the ideas that go into this. Um, I think in my remaining time, I'll just give you a couple of uh, open problems for future work. Uh, starting with kind of the most natural one is, can any of this actually be made practical? So you know, I have certainly not tried to optimize this for, for practical concerns. I really view this as more of just a conceptual contribution that you know, mass production is kind of possible in the quantum setting. But if you actually wanted to implement this on something realistic, then you would probably want to see whether these sorts of, uh, these, these sorts of theorems can still hold when you have restrictions on the gate set uh, or, or qubit connectivity or, say, uh, the number of ancillary qubits. Um, a second open question, which is actually maybe my favorite open question from this work, is kind of asks, uh, what is the asymptotic complexity of unitary mass production? So if you have some n qubit unitary transformation, and you consider sort of the, the limit uh, as you take many repetitions of, of the per unit cost, so you know, the cost for implementing r copies of u divided by r, uh, what is the best upper bound that you can get on this quantity? Classically, for Boolean functions, it's actually known that you can get uh, an asymptotic scaling that is actually only polynomial in n. So even though you need exponential gates to compute a worst case function, once you repeat that function enough, the per unit cost actually goes down to a polynomial. And I do not know how to prove something like that in the quantum setting. Um, this proof involving decomposing into di diagonal gates kind of still gives you something that's exponential. And I think this is a really nice question. Uh, it's also closely related to something known as the unitary synthesis problem, uh, if anyone has heard of that. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, another question is just, are there any natural restricted classes of quantum gates that uh, exhibit these sorts of mass production phenomena? Uh, for example, Clifford circuits. Um, I don't know the answer. Or rather, at least I know a partial answer. So uh, if you have a Clifford circuit and you want to compute many copies of it, there's some trick you can do involving fast matrix multiplication to compute it using fewer gates overall, uh, but that decomposition will use non-Clifford gates. So you know, whether you can get anything like that using only Clifford gates, I think, is an interesting question. Um, and with that, I think I will stop there. I'd be happy to take any questions. So thank you very much, William, for your uh, very insightful talk and this parallelism between uh, the Euling's theorem in the classical Boolean case and the quantum circuit mass production. Um, are there any questions? Yeah, I see already two questions. Can you, you think? I, I could uh, repeat it for the people online. Ah, uh, good. So, so the question is, where does this r equals 2 to the little o of n over log n come from? Uh, it's sort of the point at which this recursive argument in Ulick's theorem that I didn't go into breaks down. Uh, rather, the argument doesn't actually break down completely. I think like there might be some sort of smooth trade-off. Uh, it's just that the quantum circuit complexity will no longer just match like exactly the lower bound for a single function. Uh, it'll just be something larger. But you will still get some non-trivial upper bound that uh, I believe will will be just naive repetition. <laughs>
How about now? Yeah. Good. Um, so other question. So this, uh, the cost you get is two to the end. And obviously for worst case, you can't do better than this. But if you have a, a state that's very easy to prepare a single copy of, does that scale better if you have mul multiple copies of them? Uh, good. So th this says nothing in the case that you have a state that's very easy to prepare. Um, and, and indeed, I think like another way to, to interpret Ulrich's theorem is that actually uh, the states that you can not mass produce are these very special states. They're, 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 they're the easy states, or, or similarly for Boolean functions. Um, it, it's the hard ones that admit mass production phenomena. Um, so yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't know if there's like a general statement that you can get savings. Uh, in fact, I think even for, for, you know, like if you have something that's only computable in linear time, then, you know, it, it might be impossible to beat just naive repetition. Okay. <laughs> well, are uh, there any other questions? Maybe I can also ask one. Um, so you were mentioning that your interest was uh, not really immediately practical, but can we, uh, maybe if we exploit some group structure or uh, like commutativity of the different gates. Size of what structure? Uh, some group structure, group like for, structure. In, uh, for instance, like if we are uh, trying to implement the diadal group or this kind of uh, gate set having group structure, is it possible to scale down even more the essentially compress the? Sorry, so, so you're asking like if we're if we're trying to implement some special functions, like N or um, essentially a, sp a function that is implemented by a group of circ uh, circuits that is made of a gate set, which is a group, for instance. Can you? I see. Um, not that I know of. I mean, it's a good question, but yeah, I mean, like pr pretty much the only thing I, I was able to say about like practical constraints is that uh, you can sort of, you, you can get like some depth versus ancilla qubit trade off here. So like I in this circuit, there's something that you're basically repeating a bunch of times and it turns out you can either do that in parallel or, or sequentially, it doesn't make a difference. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I, I don't really know anything about uh, whether there's any restricted examples where you can get these sorts of speed ups. All right, thank you very much. Okay. And uh, if there are no other questions, I think we can thanks again William for his very nice talk. Thank you. <laughs>